Waikino Station, located on the southern shores of Lake Taupo, has been converted to a dairy sheep operation and began milking this season for a Māori-Chinese joint venture, Maui Milk. The farm plays a key role in promoting Maui Milk to offshore markets, where affluent customers expect high standards of animal welfare and environmental protection to underpin their food production. Chairman of Maui Milk, Paul McGilvray, explains. Maui Milk is a joint venture between Chinese business interests and Maori business interests here based around Turangi in the North Island. It's a company that's been formed to produce sheep milk products, to farm sheep, to produce milk, to produce products, particularly for the Chinese market, but also for other markets. Sheep milk products have two huge advantages. One is that the products themselves are highly nutritious. You've got twice as much protein in sheep milk as you have in bovine milk. It has low allergenicity. It's very, very tasty and very, very nutritious. And also no beta-1 casein. It's all A2 milk naturally. So the benefits of the product are significant. On the other side, producing it using sheep has a much lower environmental footprint than dairy cows, especially in these sensitive areas around New Zealand's most attractive lakes. The 40% shareholder in Maui Milk is the Waitui Kuratau Trust. They had been uh, experimenting with sheep milk products since about 2007, uh, but the, the addition of the Chinese investment to, to their facilities um, has really enabled us to, to make a step change in, 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 in the progress of the company. The big challenges right now are really twofold. One, we've got to get the genetics of these new sheep because sheep milk are very different genetically to a meat wool producing sheep. So we've got to get genetics that will support the kind of yields we need from these sheep. And secondly, with that is you've got to have the farm systems that can extract the most from that genetics. So there's one part of our challenges of farming. The other part, of course, is what we do in the market. At the moment, we're producing milk powder. Um, milk powder is, has got a good shelf life uh, and it's relatively stable and we can sell it. But we think in the long run, we can produce products which much better returns than milk powder. So our challenge there is to actually d decide what products and what investment is needed to produce those either in New Zealand or in the market. The infrastructure is being built. You know, some infrastructure is there. We have a dryer that can actually produce the milk powder. We have our farm systems that are basically in place and we have the genetic improvement work going on, particularly through the work being done on this station here at Waikino. But it's fair to say that I think uh, it has to go a lot further yet to be a successful industry for New Zealand. But all the signs so far are good. This season is our first season milking. We started milking on the 10th of September. It's a 64 bale rotary that we're using, which is a French design um, that was installed by GEA and Mainland. The ones that you're seeing on the platform now are Coopworth East Frisian, a combination of high producing hoggets and tudus. We had quite a lot of difficulty training them to start with because these sheep had not been handled as much as what we're handling them today. I believe next season with our hand reared lambs that training is going to be much easier. The actual milking is a lot less labour intensive. Um, sheep can be a lot more labour intensive in the fact that they have to be shorn and crutched and, and things that go along with sheep. All the ewes are EID'd. Production is recorded daily, as well as conductivity, which is your somatic cell count, and that's all run through a dairy plan system. The system that we're using is very low labour intensive once the sheep are trained on the platform. We have a lot of challenges, different challenges from dairy cows. We can't treat our sheep for things like fly strike, and lameness is an issue and it has proved an issue in our barns with the type of bedding that we're using. So that's a talking point at the moment, is looking at changing from a bark, if you like, to some sort of bedding that's going to not cause so many health issues. So with the fly strike, none of our sheep on the platform can be treated um, because there hasn't been a lot of um, testing done on products for sheep. 
So milk withhold periods are an absolute issue. So once we get fly strike on the platform, we take the ewe out of the milking system, treat her, and then she's returned to a dry mob. The barns are here really to work out what is best for the sheep, the genetics that we're bringing onto the farm. To almost work a hybrid system, whereas we farm them outside as well as inside in certain weather conditions. We've got enough barn space to house 2,000 ewes that are fed lucerne baleage and a pellet product that we put onto the conveyor belts in the barns. We have 135 hectares of lucerne on the total farm and we milk off 60 hectares of lucerne up here on the milking platform. The rest of the farm, we've got 300 cattle um, grazing on the farm and we fatten our lambs on the lucerne. Um, controlling pasture has been quite an issue this season um, because of the low stock numbers. Pasture management has been a big learning curve the sheep behind us are on 12 hour grazing and they'll have lucerne one part of the day and then come to um, pasture the other part of the day. And we offer them rock salt in the paddock because of the high lucerne content of their diet. To make sure that our rotation is working, we've been topping and also using cattle in behind the ewes to control the length of the pasture. They're 50-50 on grass and lucerne, and pellets are really just an addition to see how they perform milking-wise. We have a regrassing plan on the dairy platform here. 35 hectares of Italian will go into a better performing grass for the sheep, and that will be happening this season. The challenge going forward is working out how the new genetics are going to perform and how they're going to adapt to the New Zealand climate and how we're going to produce a sheep that can adapt to being milked outside with a hybrid system. Waikino Station is not only home to around 2,000 milking ewes, but also to a dairy sheep breeding program aimed at producing a dairy sheep composite for New Zealand conditions. Waikino Station's Chinese investors are also joint venture partners in Southern Cross Dairy Sheep Technology Limited, along with Jake Chardon and long-time genetics operator Peter Gatley. I spent the last 25 years involved in genetics for a long time with LIC as the general manager of the genetics unit there. And while there, Jake Chardon and I created a deer genetics company called Deer Improvement. We both have a long history in, in dairy genetics and we loved that, but we loved the excitement that came from creating something brand new in deer and we wanted to relive that and that's why we got interested in dairy sheep. We just saw that it was a blank canvas. It was very obvious to Jake and I right from the outset that we needed to import new genes. The entire New Zealand dairy sheep industry until now has been based on East Friesian genes, but East Friesian genes from a very small gene pool of something like four rams and 11 ewes that came in in 1992. Not enough to base an industry on, not enough genetic diversity. Effectively 1980s genetics, we had to bring in new genes. I didn't take a huge amount of research to identify that the um, Lacone genetics from France really are the only ones that are subject to a, a, um, a large scale, robust, scientifically founded genetic program and uh, we were keen from the outset to, um, to work with the, uh, the French and sample their genetics. And we developed a relationship over a couple of years with multiple trips uh, to France that, uh, that Jake made and, and visits from, uh, by the French to come out here. And ultimately we were able to, um, to come to an arrangement to, um, to bring in uh, some thousands of straws last year from 45 different sires, largely unrelated, so huge genetic diversity. And that was uh, really a, a turning point for this whole industry, I think. <laughs> to get things underway, we had to create a base the advice was that Coopworth was a good place to start. So we're looking here at animals that are typically 50% Lacone, very modern, highly developed genetics, supported by East Frisian, but sitting on a Coopworth base. So a pretty interesting cross. With the involvement of the three breeds underpinned by the Coopworth, there's a lot of genetic diversity in there. We'd like to think that most of what we want is in there somewhere, but you've got to 
you've got to put, a, put it all into the washing machine, if you like, and, um, and then extract the useful stuff. So we have to apply selection pressure on everything that's important to us. And, you know, if you take the uh, comparison with dairy cattle, the traits are virtually identical to what we've spent so many years selecting for in dairy cattle. You know, it's utter conformation, it's, it's volume, it's components, it's um, somatic cells, it's everything. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we're, we're running a program here that gives us sufficient scale. We have um, high quality information, DNA peritons testing. We have inline electronic milk meters, so we get uh, production information from every ewe at every milking. We have an enormous advantage in sheep in short generation interval. It's a fact that if you halve the generation interval, you double the rate of gain. And the sheep milk as hoggets, as yearlings, whereas dairy cattle two years old. So not only that, they have more than one offspring. So the potential for genetic improvement is huge. As a genetic program, we have a demand for a number of males that are required for, uh, for natural mating, for backup for AI and, and for others to start uh, upgrading sheep for dairying. So there's certainly a demand off this property for quite a number of males. But across the two properties that we have within Maui Milk, the other males that are not required, they are all sent off farm to specialised rearers who take them through and finish them you know, as a regular sheep and uh, I don't think they'd be your first pick of, of sheep to finish, but they certainly, uh, you know, when they get there, they, uh, there's nothing wrong with the meat. We look at what the dairy goat people have achieved. We admire what they have achieved. I think it's fantastic. It's taken them about 30 years. They've grown to 200 million. Uh, let's be realistic. Uh, this opportunity is potentially very exciting for a relatively small number of farmers in New Zealand. It's potentially quite exciting for New Zealand agriculture in terms of diversification, but it's niche, it's definitely niche. But when you consider things like high value, uh, potentially stability and payout, um, environmental sustainability, uh, that's, that's huge. I mean, here we are right on the shores of Lake Taupo and you know we've got a lower nitrogen discharge allowance than most of the sheep and beef guys have locally. Dairy cows are out of the question here, so it's got a lot to offer, but I don't see it as being mainstream. The Dairy Goat Cooperative in New Zealand pays around $18, but you need to have investment in shares, so we discount that to, call it $17, a kg of milk solids, including lactose. We'd love to be able to deliver that to our farmers. $17 a kg of milk solids, fat, protein and lactose. That's pretty much equivalent to about $3 a litre at the high concentration of sheep milk. That's what we would like to deliver to our farmers. We need to be successful in the market in order to be able to do that, but that's what we're uh, going to attempt to do. This program was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.